Good. Welcome everyone to the third day of the Missing Data Workshop. Uh, this morning I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Rafael Irizarry. He's a professor of applied statistics at Harvard and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, he's received the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Society's President's Award, which is a very prestigious uh, early career award in um, statistics, and the Benjamin Franklin Award in Life Sciences as well, uh, for his many, many very interesting papers in, in bioinformatics that have been cited many times. Uh, he's also a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the International Society for Computational Biology. So with that, we welcome Dr. Azari to speak to us today about single-cell RNA-seq uh, statistical challenges. Yeah, great. Thanks for the invitation. So uh, we, my lab usually shares our, we share our updates on Twitter, that's the best way to keep track of the latest we've, we've been working on in case you're interested in following our work. And then we also have a GitHub page with uh, software and other information about what we do. So this is not, so when I, I got invited to this uh, workshop, uh, I had a paper out that its title was had missing data in it. Uh, but I, now we've realized that it's not really a missing data problem at all. So we will, I'll be talking about that as well. Uh, although some, some of the statistical techniques that we use to, to solve the problems that we're, we encounter are, are similar to what, what, the, what the innovations uh, are similar to, to, to the methodology that's been developed for missing data. So with that uh, apology, I'll start. So the, 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 this is what I'm going to be doing today, just so you can keep track of, or, or know what's coming. So the, the first thing I'll do is I'll give you a very quick introduction to, to, to my world, what I, the world that I work in, uh, in terms of applying statistics. Uh, and, then, and then from there, go into a very brief description of what single cell and ISIC is. I know you've, there, there's been other talks in the workshop about this, so I'll keep that short. Uh, then, then we'll go on to describe in a chronological order the problems we have encountered and how we have uh, dealt with them. And that first one is where we thought we were dealing with a missing data problem, but then figured out that um, with new technologies, it, it pretty much turned into another type of problem. So you'll see what, you'll see what I mean as I describe it. Okay, so this is my world. This is a, a figure an uh, image search for workflows in genomics that you get on Google. And it is very common in the genomics world that people that develop statistical solutions to problems uh, call them workflows and describe them as a series of little boxes and arrows. Um, they basically say this. And what we do is we, we also participate in, in the world of developing the pre-processing and analysis tools, uh, but also common is, is that we find flaws in what are what become standard workflows. The field moves very fast. So whoever develops the first analysis processing tool often gets a lot of uh, users and, and then there's then inertia sets in and, and it's hard to change that, even though those procedures aren't necessarily rigorous statistically or, or justified completely. Um, so when often what we do is we, we get a collaborator to ask us to help with them something. We try these workflows, sometimes they're fine, but often we find that they are not, they're making assumptions that aren't appropriate or they are uh, just simply using incorrect statistical thinking in, in, in their development. So I'll give you, uh, one, a couple of, one example really of how, of, of where we caught that, caught, caught, caught this and then describe some of the solutions that we've developed based on, on statistical thinking. So this is the, this is the tips that we give people working in our era that aren't statisticians that are using these tools. Uh, be very skeptical of unexpected results and always, always do data visualization before and after your analysis. 
enduring as well. So you're going to see a lot of, you're going to see very few formulas, but a lot of plots of data. I don't have, I don't think, I don't have any simulated or maybe, no, I don't think I have any simulated data or cartoon data. It's all actual data from experiments and uh, from our collaborators and from the public repositories. So this is uh, some of the unexpected results that we see in in single cell RNA seq. So just very briefly, uh, I've been working in, in with collaborators that are interested in measuring gene expression for a long time, and the technologies that are used to measure gene expression have been changing during the last 20 years. And this single cell is, single cell RNA seq is the latest. But in essence, what you want to do is you want to have you want to be able to compare. For example, you want you want to be able to compare two populations. It could be cancer normal, it could be one type of cancer versus another, and try to, or, or a person who responds to a drug and a person that doesn't, or a group of people who respond and a group that don't, and you want to see if there's, even though maybe their genomes are the same, there's no mutations to explain these differences, maybe for, for some reason that we might not be able to explain right away, some genes expressed, expressed differently in the two, and that somehow leads to the two being to have having different responses or different phenotypes. So there's a lot of interest in measuring gene expression. And for 20 years, we've been able to do it on a high throughput fashion, meaning that we can measure gene expression for pretty much all genes in one shot. So you take one little piece of tumor and you, you process it and you get back the levels of expression for every gene in our genomes. Now, what, what has changed a little bit since when I started to now, a two big changes. One is that we changed the way we measure it from hybridization techniques that are based on RNA, uh, turning RNA into DNA that then attaches to a, you can call it like, a, you can think of it like a, as a lobster trap, be, trapping a lobster, it attaches to another piece of, of, of DNA. And then it has a little uh, fluorescence that lets you see it and that lets you count, count how much of that gene there is that transition to sequencing technology where you actually grab the little RNA transcripts and you sequence them instead of having them attached to anything, you just sequence them. And then once you know they're sequenced, you can figure out which gene it is and you can count them. So we're, we're, now, we're now using technology that just counts the little transcripts of RNA, the little molecules of RNA that are in the whatever sample we're, we're trying to analyze we're actually counting each and every single, well, the ones that we sample, we, we count them. So then the, the second big innovation, which was technologies that let us do this at the, for instead of getting, getting a little chunk of, of, of a tissue, which often has many different kinds of cells in it, and we hope for the best that somehow things average out and we see something important or irrelevant, to a technology where you can get cell by cell, you can count these transcripts. That's, that's quite a feat if you, if, you, if you understand the technology involved. You take every single cell, that's where the name comes from, and you, are, you sample, you grab a sample of, of RNA transcripts from that cell, and you, you have to amplify them to be able to count them. I mean that you, 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 you put PCR, so each single one of them amplifies into many, and then you, you, you sequence them and count them. So that's where that's how the data is generated, and it it generates large data sets. Uh, relatively speaking, we have we're able to do millions of cells at once. Some some labs are able, or some consortia are able to do that these days. And one of the things that people got excited about, there's many others, but one of them is that they think that they can discover new cell types that, that we didn't know about before. And the way that this is done. Is, is with unsupervised clustering. So you, 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 you run some kind of clustering algorithm on these vectors. So let me go back for a second. You, you, the data comes in as a, a big matrix with the way we analyze it, the, the genes are on the rows and the columns are the cells. And it's just a bunch of vectors of counts. So you, you, you put, this, you put this, these, these matrices into a into a clustering algorithm of some kind. The, the pictures you're seeing here are using PCA followed by TISNI. Uh, it's a type of, of, of visualization tool to try to see clusters. Actually, it goes, 
it goes some kind of clustering and then it's visualized with TISNI. And you know these these what these look like are artistic renditions of of uh, of data, but it's it's actually you can actually get these pictures by putting the the, the data through mathematical processes. And now I um, I'm going to show you that I that there's so much noise and there's so little information in single in each one of these single vectors. It's, it's kind of hard to believe that these are not of some of these at least aren't just artifacts. So if you don't know what TISNI is, uh, it's a a uh, visualization tool that will map high dimensional data into two dimensions and it'll try to do it. It's not linear. It'll try to do it in a way that maximizes separation. So you can imagine how this could lead to artifacts because it's trying purposely to, to split things up. And the reason people want, like doing this is because then they can show that the audience, the journal, the readers that these pretty pictures where what they think are new cells are separated out clearly but it's very much driven by the, the, the way the algorithm works. So I'm, I'm gonna show you the first data set that we worked with and where we saw something like this. Uh, and it, it, is, it comes from five different people from which five, for each one a a had a tumor and was extracted, or at least part of the tumor was extracted. And from that, each one of those tumors, many cells were processed. So each point here is a cell. And I'm using PCA here to show you just an exploratory plot of the data. And it's showing you the, the first two principal components. And you can see that the tumors kind of separate out already with just two dimensions. So you can imagine that if you go further down, you'll be able to find some way of clustering these in a way that they separate. But even with the first two, you already see some some separation. This is this is an it's an interesting result, and it gets it, it's it's pub it's a publishable result. But the thing that we noticed that was maybe problematic here is that knowing how these things are processed, we knew that these were probably processed at different times, and they, in fact they were. So here is a it, there were five tumors, and they were processed in six batches. And they're confounded completely, except one of the tumors was processed in two batches. That's five and six. So five and six are one tumor, and all the other ones is perfect confounding. And you can and you can see that the batch also, well, not surprisingly, because it's perfectly confounding, has the same separation. But what is concerning here is that the fifth, the, the fifth and sixth, which are from the same tumor, also separate. So it's we start to wonder if this is batch driven, or is it biology driven? So to get to the bottom of this, we have to go back to the, to try to figure out what's going on and go back to the raw data and, and explore that. So here's a close up of that, um, of that uh, fifth and sixth batches, which is the same tumor, a very clear separation <coughs> on just two PCs. All right, so once we see this, we try to figure out what it is. And one of the, one of the first thoughts that came to mind and turned out to be uh, an important part of the explanation was that when you you can you can see just from from just the first exploratory plots when you get data from single cell that if you take the the if you just count how many different genes are observed different transcripts are observed in each cell it varies a lot from cell to cell and that that could be because some cells are bigger than others and that could be real, but it, but a more likely explanation is that is that the experimental protocol led you to create artificially more more um, uh, multiplied out uh, transcripts than in others. Or when you sampled, when you when I'm using sample in three different ways. I apologize for that, but when I'll try to use my hands, when you sample the RNA from the cell, sometimes you might be more successful than others, and you will end up with more or less. Uh, total number of, uh, of, seek of transcripts. So you can think of, if you, you want to, if you want to start thinking of this as a statistician, you can think of having each cell is a bag that has many, many balls of different colors in it. Every, the colors represent the genes and the number of each color represents gene expression for that gene. And you're, you're, you're putting your hand in and picking some out. Sometimes you get 
more than sometimes you get a thousand sometimes you get ten thousand and then once you have that then you then you count the colors and that's what the data is it's just a count of how many greens how many pinks how many you need you need twenty thousand colors but you get the picture okay so so what we so knowing that we looked we just looked at the um well, the, then the other thing is that we, the other thing you see from exploration is that you, you would see way, a lot of zeros and this is where the missing data comes in. You see a much, many more zeros counts than you see in previous technologies, which kind of makes sense because it's harder to, you're just dealing with one cell. Uh, so the, one of the first things we, we explored was let's just look at the, let's see what part of, of, the, of the variability is explained just by the proportion of zeros. And that we did it through a bunch of experiments. We saw that there was very high correlation between the proportion of, we, here we say detected genes. This is back when we were using kind of the language of, of missing data. Uh, but this is just basically the proportion of non-zero counts for each cell on the x-axis and then the PC1 on the y-axis. And you can see it's a strong correlation. Sometimes, you know, it's almost, it's almost the same thing. So that's not good. And then you, when you look at the proportion of zeros by batch, you can see again that it's it's changing. So that's concerning. Okay, so this is if you want to read more about this, this is the paper. Here it is. It says missing data in it, um, and and that's and now now you're going to see why why that was happening. Okay, so that so that first observation was done with a technology that amplified out the genes amplified out the transcripts and counted them. So you had, you had, and this is why it looked like missing data. So you would have, if, if a gene was cut, was found, was, was grabbed, it multiplied out and you would see counts in the hundreds or th even thousands. If it wasn't, you would see zero. But the point is that you can start with a one, you can start with just, just having one transcript. And then, it, and then, but the count you see is up in the hundreds or thousands because they got amplified. So you, so, if going, so you might have one, zero, two, three, four, then the amplification turns it into zero, 100, 200, 300, and then it looks, it looks a little bit like missing data, and you'll see some pictures of that soon. Um, but then a, te a technological change occurred where they had a way to know wh which things were, were just duplicates, and, it, and then you can know how many original unique transcripts you have. And that now reduces the data, that changes the data completely. And you're gonna see some of that now. So now we're looking at what's called UMI data. UMI stands for Unique Molecular Identifier. So we start doing the, we, so we thought maybe this will you know, solve the problem, but it, the, the, the relationship here is, is stronger. So this is like, this is the same plot now with, uh, with the UMI data. So here's the first, we do PCA, this first dimension, and then the proportion of zeros. And you can see how many, how, how many are as 95% zeros is typical. Uh, and then on the colors are the, just the total number of UMI and that, uh, that must be a log transformation or something. I forgot how we made that plot. But it's not surprising that, and that the percent of zeros is strongly correlated to how many total different things you, you have. And now that takes us back to the, to the multinomial example where I have all these bags. If you have 10,000 different colors in the bag and balls of each and you grab 100, you're gonna have a bunch of colors you don't see because you only took 100. If you take 10,000, now there'll be much less things you don't see. So you'll see less zeros. So this is, this is you can predict this completely with just a multinomial. So the other thing we started doing was we took some completely false uh, negative control experiments. What I mean by that, in this, this particular one you're looking at, this is just to demonstrate to the community what, how, how, how these problems can lead you to think you're finding new things when you're not. So we took a, uh, a completely negative control experiment where they, it wasn't even real cells, it was just RNA put into a little wells where every single one was supposed to be the same. And then they put it through the, through the technology and we, we took that data and we put it through the standard workflows that people were using and, or still are using actually. And there's a Tisney plot and you can see all these little fake clusters showing up because Tisney is pushing them out there. 
but this and the, and the, and you can also see that they they tend to be bluer. Some of them are tend to be bluer. There's more red in the middle. That is the fraction of zero. So this seems to be driven partly by that, not surprisingly, by the first PC, which 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 is very much correlated with the proportion of zeros. So here's a another more dramatic pl plot. Same thing, Tisney, but now instead of instead of completely artificial data set. This is a, this is a real cell, but they're all supposed to be the same thing because some expert made sure that I won't get into how they do it, but there's some fact sorting where they, they can try to, they can try to do it so that you only have one cell type. So this is a, this is supposed to be another negative control experiment. And here we really see how the proportion of zero is driving the, 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 the appearance of different groups with all the blue ones, low, oh, sorry, high, so, Low fraction of zeros. Where am I going? Over here on the on the right, and then the red down here at the bottom. So let's look at the data uh, from the raw data. Not go forget those PC plots. Let's just go back to the original data. So here's what, and in this a lot. This looks a lot like a, like it could be a missing data problem, and, but you're going to see why it is in a second. Uh, so. This is a histogram of the counts for one gene. Uh, you can see there's a ton of zeros. And then there's like this bimodal thing over on the right. So this, how do, knowing how this technology works, this is a very strange thing to see because we know that the original, original data is very low count. So why are we seeing this? Like what's log two log? That's like a thousand. Okay, so what's going on here is that th th there's, a, there's a transformation that occurs. So they take the original data and then you see how the X on the, um, oh, I think I explained it here. Um, yeah, so based on that plot, this is a lot of, of statist statisticians and others started fitting zero inflation models where you, you had the zero part to describe missing data somehow. Uh, but it turns out that it, that if you look at the raw data, it's it's very it's not it's this is not the right model. So I'll show you that in a second. But the data that you've seen, and the reason I show it to you is not because I like that. I don't I don't want that people to be using that transformation. It's because that's a transformation that to this day still a lot of people use. They get their they get their matrix, and without even looking at it, they apply this transformation. They take the count. This is the actual number in the cell that you start with. They divide it by the total of the, of the I, I say column, because I get the, the cells in the columns and the genes in the rows. So I take, they take the sum, of the, the, the sum of all the counts in the column. That's the total, sometimes called coverage. They have other names that use for this. So that gives you the, that kind of gives you a rate. If you, were, if you were estimating a multinomial, this would be your estimate of the, of the probability for that particular color of ball or gene. Then they multiply it by a million, just so that it has a nice kind of unit to it. And then they add one, why? Because there's zeros. So what does that do? Here's, so here is an example of a gene. We picked, for this example, I picked a gene that has actually quite a, a, one of the highest average number of counts. This is, there's a, as you saw, there's a lot of zeros. There's also a lot of low count genes. This is a gene that has a, a relatively high count, but this is the raw data. This is what you start with. It's counts, it's, it's integers. And it looks pretty much like a Poisson distribution, doesn't it? So that's, that's, that's the original data. That doesn't look like a, a zero inflated model. That doesn't look like to be any missing data. It's just like, if you have a Poisson with a low rate, you're gonna see zeros. That's just the way it is. But when you divide by the total, because the total changes so much from cell to cell, you introduce a new level of variability and it introduces this weird bimodality because there's apparently some there's like a group of cells that were that had a lot of uh, of accounts and others that didn't, and then when you add one and take the log, it, it, that's when the big shift happens. Professor, that's sorry. Go ahead. Question. There's a question about um, about the negative control example with the identical cells. So mm -hmm. they ask, even if this, you're in single cell, how do you know there aren't say different stages or cell cycles? It could so be. How we don't. We don't know. Good question. We don't know, but the, 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 the more important point there is that, I mean, I guess you could make an argument that the different cell cycles have different, 
produce different number of genes somehow. It's like it will reduce the number of genes that are that are present, and or the cell becomes smaller. But uh, but because of because we see it even in the completely artificial one, we tend to to think that if you see a correlation with proportion of zeros that's that strong, we tend to think that it's our this that's a that's an art, experimental artifact. But but one thing I'll 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 show later in the method is that. Let's suppose that that's not, let's suppose it is biology. Uh, maybe, I don't know if I should, no, I'll answer it now just because I'll forget later. Let's suppose it is biology, that biology leads to different proportions of zeros or different, or another way to think about it, that biology leads to the, to the sum of the columns, the total number of genes observed, as ex, the total amount of expression observed in each, uh, in each cell changes. That's fine. If you believe that, that's fine, but then, that's the, that's what you should be reporting. It's just that you sum and that's, you say, look, these cells have more than these other ones. You don't have to, there's no need for TISNI. You're just, you're just reporting a total sum. That's all you have to do. So what we're doing, what I'm getting to is a method that separates those two things out. You, you can ask, you, you get the N, I call it now N, the total number of cells N, because I'm now using the multinomial um, notation. You get that. You get that estimate or it's not even, yeah, you get that estimate and then you get the other stuff that may have to do with how genes are changing. So yeah, so th that's a good question. And we don't, the answer is we don't know. But again, we, we, want, we have a method that lets you split up the, the, and interpret correctly what you're actually seeing. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's one. So you can see you start out with this, that's the raw data and you end up with this completely driven by the transformation. Here's, another, here's a more typical example. This is a, a gene. Um, this is a more typical gene. Stop it. More typical gene. We'll, you'll have like mostly ones and twos and some threes and that's it. And then, so you'll start with that. that that's your, you can make, you know, to summarize that. You can just write down a table of how many of each one you have. But instead, these transformations are turning it into something that looks zero inflated. So yeah, it looks it looks like it's missing data when it really is, it is not. So here's here's another more convincing evidence that it isn't necessarily a missing data problem. Um, but we can predict. So if if you compute the log mean expression, that gives you for each gene, right? And, and you think this is a multinomial, so we turn it in so you can actually model it. You can compute the probability, and you can and also let me stop there multinomial and we can approximate very well with Poisson. That's just a standard statistical result. So for each gene, we have, we can compute the log mean expression. And with that, that's the, you know, that's like the rate. We can, we can predict the proportion of zeros. So the, the little circles here, the little dots are the observed values of the mean and the fraction of zeros. And then the lines, the curves, are the prediction from a multinomial and a Poisson. So it's multinomial and Poisson. Explain it. No need for a mult for a, for a missing data or a, or a zero inflated model. Here's what this, this is the artificial example with no no biology. Here's the the here's the uh, biology example with the cells that are actually real cells. And there we still see that it predicts very well, although we do see that the, the dots are, tend to be a little bit higher than the curve. If you fit, that's probably because there's, there's, there's variability, natural variability on top of the Poisson sampling. And if you use a negative binomial, then you catch, then you catch it. You catch that little bit of extra. It's not that much, but it's, it's pretty much, I mean, it makes complete biological sense. Uh, and, and it does, it does catch, it, the negative binomial that lets you model that does catch that. So the, the solution to this now, I've only complained now, I'm gonna give you a solution that we've implemented and it's, it's works, it seems to work well. Uh, it's not, it's nothing, it's nothing fancy. Uh, it's basically a, uh, a GLM version of PCA. So but why were we doing PCA? This, that's a question that I, I, um, I don't have a great answer for, except to say that that's what the people doing these experiments want. It's not clear why they want it just yet, but since it was so popular to do PCA first, 
and then do Tisney and then do clustering or whatever, then we, we wanted to give our collaborators a solution. If they are going to use PCA, at least use this version instead of the, of the, of the previous one, which was just, just do PCA on the log, on the log transform data. And that, so the idea is you assume a model, the, the a likelihood model where the, the, the counts are either Poisson or negative binomial. And then you model the, the you use the standard log uh, link where you, you and then on, uh, once you use the, the standard log link, you, you have the PCA, what you need for a PCA model, like the factors model. So you have factors and loadings and U and V. And then you have a, because it's multinomial or Poisson, you have a, a, an offset, which is the total. So, some people that, that do similar things, they actually estimate, they put a, a parameter in front of that too, and they estimate it. They estimate the parameter, because maybe sometimes it's not going to be uh, this simple. But when we do that, we almost always get numbers very close to one for that parameter. So we don't, we don't even bother. Although it doesn't, doesn't affect it too much if you put it there. We that's, have that's, quick yeah, go ahead. Another question. Go ahead. I assume this is for data from a single cell type. Otherwise, it would be a mixture model. Yeah, this is single cell. But from a Count. single cell type, they're asking. Yes. Uh, well, no, not necessarily because we, we whatever biology there is, we're hoping it gets caught. It, it's it's supposed to be summarized by the by the factors. That's the idea. Yeah, but. So that's what that's where the, the the u and v those are the those are the the, late, the latent variables uh, the factors the latent factors. Now you could add you could add a if you know a cell type and you and you and you want to just add a parameter to describe that you can right you can add a linear term here for that as well. That's not that's not um, important. But this is but again what what we're 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 providing a method for people that have a data set and they just want to get to PCA and explore. So, so this is, so hopefully whatever biology they think is there will be caught by, by the, by the factor, by the factors and the loadings. Okay. So um, there, so here's, here's a comparison of, of the, of what's being, what was being done before PCA on the log transform data. As I showed earlier, it has a very strong relationship with a zero fraction. Once you fit it with GLM and you have the offset, it goes away. This is the fake, the totally fake uh, data. And I shouldn't say fake data, the sort of uh, artificial experiment. Uh, the data is not fake, the data is real. Uh, the, the, what's, what's it's the experiment that's, it's the, it's the cells that are not real. And then here's the uh, piece, here's the, the Tisney and you, you, those little clusters kind of go away. And then here's that other one um, where you can see that the relationship with the zero fraction pretty much disappears. Not completely, but most of it. So, so going back to that question I got earlier, but what if that was real? What if that, what if that, that different zero fraction was, was due to biology, but that's okay. You have that. You have that number to, to do something with it. You can, you can write a paper about how the, the cells of one type have higher total counts than others. But again, we're separating it into two components. So it's going back to that first experiment that I, that I told you about that I inspired all this, when we do, when we apply it to that, the good news for the biologist is that the tumor data, so this is, this is the original, this is, this is a version of the plot I started with, where you can see that the, now I'm sorry, I changed the colors, but now it's red and gold. Red and gold are the tumor that are split across two, uh, across two, uh, uh, across two batches. So you can see they separate here, but when you apply it, the GLM PCA version, they um, they they're they're not separated anymore. But the tumors do separate. So it looked like it was actually the biology was actually is holding up at least at least here. All right. So there's there's a couple of, of papers that explain how to do all this. This is the first one is the. Um, the, the, the GLM PCA paper. And then the second one is a adaptation to that, that uh, deals with, remember I was, at the, this is more technical, but at the very beginning I was showing you uh, SmartSeq data that's no longer used, but 
the second one is a is a method for applying to 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 changing smart seek data so that you can apply the GLM PCA approach. So those are those are the papers, and now you can see that instead of saying missing data, now we have now we say multi multinomial model. All right, so let me see how much time do I have. All right, all right. Yeah, so we got twenty minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then whatever time for questions included in that, roughly. Sounds good. All right, so, so, so now I'll tell you a little bit about some of what we're doing now. So the first one relates to cell classification. And this is, sim this is, this is now, we're, now we're trying to develop methods, statistical methods that can be used to two things. One is just you start out with cells and you don't know what they are when you start. Sometimes you do because somebody goes through a painstaking uh, procedure of sorting the cells into groups that you think now you know what each one is. But usually you, you, you just know, you, all you know is what's, what tissue type they came from. Remember our, remember our tissues are, are not one cell. If you, if you take a little piece of skin, you'll get like 10 different cell types. Same with the brain, you'll get a few different, you got neurons and glia and a bunch of other things. So when you get a, a little piece of tumor or a little piece of, of, of normal tissue, it's gonna, be a bunch of, it's gonna be a bunch of different cell types and it won't, how do you know which one's which? So, so you could look at each one under the microscope and try to figure out, but then they have these other techniques to, to try to, to do it um, called fact sorting. So one of the, one of the applications of, of single cell is, is being able to, to know, to separate out the cells into cell types. And then, you can, then once you know that, you can, you can do different things. Like if you think that the differential expression analyses in the past weren't really revealing anything because of this mixture problem. And if, but if you were able to isolate the cell type that mattered, then you would see it. Now, now you can do that as long as you know which cell type it is. So that's one. And the other one is just novel uh, cell types. I, I gotta say, I can't really, I don't really know why that's, uh, I can't give you an explanation of why that's important, but certainly many, many people are trying to to, to define new cell types with this technology. So I'll get to that as well. So the, the, these are two very, are very much related. But at the end of the day, what we wanna have is, is, is rigorous statistical tools that could perhaps improve the rigorousness of these results that are currently being published, which I think are, a lot of it is false positive. False positive clusters lead to false positive uh, cell, new quote unquote new cell types. So I'm, I'm trying to show you what I mean by that and, and show you how, um, how we, uh, what we propose doing that's, that's perhaps better. So, so what I'm showing you here is again, this Tisney plot of, of a data set where, where the data was sorted to include only four cell types. So this is one of those rare, rare experiments where we think we know what each one is. And the clustering, uh, algorithm, the standard clustering algorithm says there's six. When we do the Tisney plot, it doesn't necessarily really look like there's six uh, there. It does look more like four. Uh, I would say maybe one, two, three, four. Oh, sorry, one, one, two, three, and maybe one of those is a fourth. But it doesn't really look like six. So, and the other thing that makes me think that that's not really biologically driven. If you start, if you change the number of cells you include in the analysis, you just randomly sample from the original experiment, the number of clusters found by the standard workflows changes uh, and it increases with the number of cells. So there, there seems to be a bias that the more cells you have, the more clusters you discover. Someone could argue that's just because you have more power to discover the true number of clusters, but I think that these, I, 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 dis, I would disagree with that based on what I've seen and say that it's, it has more to do with that. Um, there's more, there's just more room to make mistakes. Okay, so how, how are another, another problem with the current approach to, uh, to, this, to this idea of finding, of, of classifying cells based on, on, on the raw single cell data is that you, once you cluster, then you have to figure out which cluster goes with which cell type. And, and, the, and the, a common way to do that, very common way to do this is, is to use something called cell markers, uh, 
gene, marker genes, cell type marker genes, which are there's, there, there's databases or there's resources that tell you which genes definitely are expressed in, in certain cell types. The problem we find with that is that it is that those marker genes sometimes aren't necessarily really marker genes, so there might be some errors in the database, but even if they are, because of the sparsity problem, because this is a multinomial with so low sam sample size and, and, and so many different genes, you actually have a high chance of not seeing a marker gene expressed when it actually is expressed. I guess that's kind of a missing data problem. So, so, so just to, sh to show that I have, uh, we, we took this, this is just an example with some data we had. These are the, those four groups that we are, we're told we have. And, and, this, and this is a, a subset of the, of the cells. So you can make a plot. And then we have marker genes. So this NK, natural killer cells, these five are marker genes that we're told these five are marker genes. The first two are definitely marker genes, although they're showing up in some of these too. Um, but then these other three aren't really showing up a little bit, not much. Then you have the same for CD14. We're told these five are marker genes and you can see that, yeah, maybe this one is a good one, but these other ones aren't great. Uh, and et cetera, you go to that. And then once you get to these two, it's really kind of terrible. These marker genes really don't, don't really help you much. So you can see why some of these techniques that are currently implemented are gonna, are gonna lead to, to mistakes. Here's a, this is another representation of that, of that plot where I'm averaging the proportion of, of times that we, we actually observe a, even a one, a count of one for those supposed marker genes. So what you would want to see here is in, in, in this, in the red down here, you want to see all the reds up here and the other ones at the bottom. For the green, you want to see the green at the top and the others at the bottom. For the blue, same blue here, rest at the bottom, purple, pur so you don't see that. You, you kind of see it for these two and this one and that, and maybe that one, although we also have this purple one up there. So clearly not great. So what we have noticed is that if you compare these to, to these, these cell types, what we're doing here is we have hundreds, thousands actually, we have thousands of cells for each one. So we can compute a, a rate for each gene based on these thousands of, of cells that should, should have decent precision. And now we have two vectors. Now we have the rate estimates for each gene on each cell type, not each cell. And when we compare those, we see that the marker, so here's, here's CD4s against natural killer cells. The blue ones are the, no, the supposed known markers. And you can see that these two seem to be right because they're high in CD4s and, and, not, and very low. I think this is basically zero on the other one. But what, the other thing we see is there's, the, there's the, all these other genes that could be useful. Like we have all, this, all these genes here and all these guys that are very high in one and not the other. Same thing with this comparison. The blue genes are the known. Oh, I think that I may put incorrectly put the same plot there. Sorry, I have I have other examples. Um, that's just the same pl plot. Okay. Um, so, so what we're what we're trying to do to to, to is to use this to determine um, mar marker genes, but we want to do it in a way where you can you can acknowledge the fact that even when you when it is marker, it is the probability of observing it is low. Okay, so so we what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what the distribution of the non-expressed genes and the expressed genes is. So to do to start getting going with that, what we did is we took each gene, we computed its rate. So that's what this histogram is. These there's two histograms here, and uh, what, what we're showing is the, in two, the two colors come from um, microarray data, which is an independent technology. And from there, we're trying to, trying to determine which gene should be on and which should be off in each tissue. And that gives us these two histograms. So the idea is that the, the, when a gene is not expressed, you have this, this distribution this blue distribution. And when it is expressed, then you have this red distribution. It just makes sense that it's higher and it should be. If it's, if it's not, we're, we're not gonna be able to do anything with this. 
But what one of the things that we we found interesting, and I think maybe some some found surprising, is that even when a gene is not expressed, you still see they're they're low rates, but we still see them. And I think it has to do with the the fact that the the genome, even when a gene isn't expressed for a reason, I guess it, it's part of some some cycle or some feedback mechanism, it might still at random just express itself just because it's just, it, sh it shouldn't really be happening. It's like this is background noise. I mean, that's a, that's a theory, but it's it just, we just see it over and over again. The genes that are supposed to be unexpressed are show up anyway. So what we do is we fit, we, we take, well, now we're not using microarray data anymore. But that was just an illustration. What we do is we fit a, a, a two component distribution to the data. So, it actually has three components because there, se there seems to be like a really low not expressed and a not so low not expressed. But the point is we can fit, a, we can fit models that, that capture the, uh, the fact that we think that there's two, um, there's two latent states here, the expressed and the not expressed states. So when we, when we do that, once we, we do that for each gene, so for each gene, we, we fit, we, we, once we fit it for the, for the overall, that gives us a, you can think of it, it's, it's like a first level model or a prior if you want to think of it as a Bayesian. And then, then we do it gene by gene. We try to find where its own specific background distribution is. And these are genes that are always off. Uh, and then the, the blue line is the mean of this, of this distribution and the red, and then the, you're going to see a red line. That's the mean of this distribution. So you can see they're always down here with the off. Not, and then here are genes that are always on. Then there's, then there's um, the, when we look at the CD4 counts that are, that are um, using that model, we, 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 can, we can use the posterior to say what's the probability that it's on or off. We see that it's, it's, it's on, it's a probability of being on is very high for a couple of them, but not so high for others. So here, are, here they are. Um, we, the other, I'm sorry, the other thing, I forgot about this slide. The other idea then is to find markers, new markers that are always on in CD4s like that. So th this is the original ones that are, the, that are, some of them are kind of close to the background distributions, but then we just explicitly go and find some that are clearly not in the background distribution. So one, once we have that, then we have for each, for each cell type, you can construct profiles and, and then the of, what, of what genes should be on and what levels should they have. And then you can, you can um, using a probabilistic model, we, use, we basically use naive Bayes. We can compute the, the probability of each cell type given their, their, their counts. Once we have this model all written, all, all, all estimated. So here, here's a comparison of our this approach is very simple, naive Bayes approach to some of the other things that are out there. Some of the other things that are out there use like uh, deep learning and all kinds of fancy stuff to, to do this. There, there is some advantages to that uh, over ours is, and it's that they can capture correlations where right now, as you saw, I was doing everything gene by gene. But I think that the complication, the complexity of it, it has a, has a, a weakness and I'm gonna tell you what it is right now. So to, to uh, to compare these these um, these uh, uh, approaches, we constructed different data sets where we have training and test, and, and we have um, we, we constructed and so that the training sets were weren't perfect in some cases. And what you and and then the other thing we did is we compared what you get in the training set to the test set. Um, so. And some, these are, these are the harder ones when you have a training set and then a test set where it has just different characteristics uh, in, that, are, that are definitely experimental, but can be corrected for. Basically by fitting models that take into account that different cells can have different uh, total number, the, the offset of that, that GLM PCA model, that same idea helps us here quite a bit, I think. So what you see is that there's, that we get high accuracy all the time but then you have methods that have very high accuracy when they have similar training and test sets. But once you change the test set, it, it's this, you can see here that they're all not doing very well. And I think it's because they're, 
they're training to a method, to a model that, to a data set that has experimental factors in it that, that, that it trains for and it's not real. It's not really part of the biology. So by, by working with latent uh, models, it, it removes that problem because you, you, you try to find the latent states in each, uh, in each, in each data set separately. So the off might be in a different, in a completely different place now, but it's, there's, it's still going to be lower than the on. And, and basically that's, I think, where the power of this approach comes. Models that don't take that into account and just try to use things like, you know, machine, straight up machine learning techniques like, like deep learning, they're basically estimating a surface and ex a conditional expectation that unfortunately when you go to a new data set, it's not, it's not there, it's, it's, it's something else. So this, what this also helps us do is that we can, because we have a, a generative model, we can also do things like compute um, uh, deviances to see if in fact, quote unquote, new clusters are, are actually dif different than the other, statistically speaking, different than, than some center. So the, the example we're giving here is, is this, we went through one of these they're called atlases where they try, they tell you what all the new cell types are. And we grabbed, we, we examined the different cell, supposed new cell types. And then we found a pair that when we did this analysis using deviance of the generative model, they seem to be the same. They did, it, it, there was no statistical evidence for these two supposed different cell types being different. And what I'm showing you here is the, the raw data for the, again, for the supposed marker genes. And you can't really, doesn't, they, really, they really don't look different except for the part that on the right, that just seems lighter overall as it, for example, that they have a smaller end, a smaller offset in which the method that found this supposed that new cluster does, didn't take into account. And I unfortunately think there's a lot of, of that, um, a lot of that going on in these, in these atlases that show you supposed new, um, New cell types. Okay, so if you want to learn more, yeah, Six more minutes. Sorry, yeah, I'm going to finish here. I'm going to skip the last part because it's it's um, it's not. I'm not going to have time to to do it justice. It's it's the last part was about um, spatial single cell RNA seq. So that one of the amazing new technologies that my collaborators have are working and developing, working with and developing. It 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 tells you for each cell. It tells you, well, for each location on a, on a tissue, it gives you a profile of gene expression. So it, you have gene expression, these vectors of gene expression and location on a, on a, on a piece of tissue. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, so this is the, 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 uh, the bioarchive manuscript describing uh, this idea that I just presented. And then I'm going to stop there and just say thank you and acknowledge all the people that helped me with this with this work thank you great thank you very much um i've written in the chat any one of the attendees or panelists who has a question please uh let me know there um so my question was um in just this last part uh when you fit your model you needed to know something about the different cell types right yeah. so if you have a new data set that you don't know what it consists of do you hope that your model from the you know that you've built from these uh, ground truth data sets will also apply or do you have to do something new or different right so that that's we have to do some that would be that's one of the adaptations we have to make currently the way we're developing is the method is for uh cell types for which we have a training set so we're izzy who was the author the um first author has done a lot of work, a lot of work to find as many data sets as possible where we have fact sorted uh, cells or, or tissue level data where we can very, we can be very sure that what the cell type is because they're, they're just so different. And there's some cases that, are, that you can computationally be very sure. So, so we've constructed a, a, a training set that has that has you know many 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 cell types, 
And the idea is to continue to grow that. But if there's, if, if you have a, a new data set where you think there's cell types that aren't on our reference set, then, then this, this will assign, this approach will assign one of them. But one of the things we can do is because we have a generative model, we can go back and check to see if some of these cells that were assigned to whatever, how far they are from, from the center, from the, whatever, I mean, there's no centers here because it's not a normal model, but you get, hope you get the idea. So, uh, so then, then we could maybe do something with that, but that's, that's not, that's current work. We're not, we don't, we're not there yet, but that definitely has to be done because there are, there are going to be new cell types or there are going to be cell, cell types in, in some kind of transition phase where they, they don't have the same, um, the same uh, uh, gene expression pattern and then that same cell type at another time of the day or whatever, or another time in development. So that's, that's, uh, that's the answer to your question is we can't handle it right now, but we, we think that this general way of approaching the problem will, will help. Great. Um, I have one more question, which is um, with the spatial um, single cell sequencing data that you mentioned right at the very end. Uh -huh. um, is it, uh, since I'm not a biologist, is it typical for cells to sort of clump in the biology so that that would be some kind of side information for clustering of cell types? Yeah, absolutely. So here's an example of, um, of a brain slice. Uh, and then you can clearly see, I mean, I'm not, I won't have time to explain what they are, but you can clearly see that the, the different cell types are, yeah. are, have a spatial pattern. Here's another one. This is another slice of the brain. But yeah, it's very much, let me see, I have, I have a few others, but definitely that's, um, that, is, that is something that we see. So the, the challenge is that because of that, so what they're interested in is finding genes that have differential expression across space, but within the same cell type. So if you, if you just do it blind, you're gonna find a bunch of marker genes because because there's a, there's a confounding with, between cell type and, 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 and spatial position, mm -hmm. it's gonna look like there's a gene that's changing expression across location, but that's not what it is. What it is is that it's just a different cell type that has that gene expressed and it's in different locations. So, the challenge here is that we first have to identify cell types and then look for spatially varying genes. That's just one of the many challenges. Very interesting. Yeah, it is, it is an interesting problem. Very hard. <laughs> okay, well, I don't see other questions in the chat. Um, so I'm just gonna thank you one more time.